Hello, everybody. This is Paul Mjema from the Jenny Goodall Institute, working as the GIS manager for the conservation project known as Landscape Conservation in Western Tanzania. My presentation will be on how we apply technological tools, ArcGIS Survey 123 and the ArcGIS online platform to monitor chimpanzee and their habitat in Western Tanzania. The overview of my presentation, I will start by a brief introduction to the Genigodoro Institute and then explain chimpanzee and their habitat in Western Tanzania, pointing out threats to chimpanzee. Later on, I will move to explain about a community-centered conservation approach known as Takare that has been used by JGI when implementing conservation projects within the local communities. Later, I will explain about how we apply ArcGIS Online and Survey 123 to empower local communities to monitor village forests. And then I will share some findings of restoration of chimpanzee habitat in Gombe Burundi Corridor through these local community efforts. The Jenny Goodall Institute, some of you might already have heard or read about Jenny Goodall Institute. This is a global community conservation organization that advances the vision and work of Dr. Jane Goodall by protecting chimpanzee and inspiring people to conserve the natural world we all share, improve lives of people, animals, and the environment. One of the famous saying of Dr. Jane Goodall is that everything is connected and therefore everyone can make a difference. The chimpanzee and their habitat in Western Tanzania. The chimpanzee in Tanzania are found in the western part of the country and most live outside national parks. They live on riverine forests and miombo woodlands. Currently, chimpanzee are listed as endangered species under the IUCN Red List of Threatened Species 2016. What are these threats which faces chimpanzee? Human activities are leading threats that potentially impact conservation of chimpanzee and their habitat, according to the Tanzania National Chimpanzee Conservation Action Plan of 2018. And these human induced threats include smallholder agriculture or sifting cultivation, settlement, and controlled fire, livestock or pastoralism, charcoal production. As you can see, this pictorial uh, poster here. There is a chimpanzee in the middle, there is a cattle herder and a dog. And on the last one, you can see this is a cattle herder. These are the photos that we captured from our chimpanzee survey that we did last year from July to October. And this was one of the trap camera that we placed in one of the sites whereby a chimpanzee was sp spotted in a certain location. And under just after five minutes, when the chimpanzee left the, the area, the same area where invaded or the cattle header moved with the cattle in the area with a dog, which means that there is a lot of interaction between livestock and chimpanzee, which might trigger some disease between chimpanzee to livestock, between livestock to chimpanzee, and between human to livestock and to chimpanzee. So this is one of the issues that need critical attention and intervention to control. Takare, this is a community-centered conservation approach, as I said, whereby Dr. Jane Goodall discovered that when we put local communities at the heart of conservation, we improve the lives of people, animals, eventually the environment. JGI, therefore, advances this vision of Dr. Jane Goodall's holistic approach, which bring the power of community-centered conservation into life. As you can see this diagram here, it starts with the community. So we go to the community, talking to them, understand what are their pressing issues, discuss about socioeconomic development, microcredit issues, family planning, family health, reproductive health, land use planning, looking at natural resources of the communities, and then looking on how agricultural practices are being done and the talk about sustainable forestry, et cetera. And through those platforms, we also discuss about natural resource management. So why JGI adapted this approach is that in the beginning, Dr. Jane Goodall started a tree planting campaign and then people started to plant trees. But later, after some times, it was dis discovered that 
people didn't continue to plant those trees or look after those trees. And some of the trees died out. And when uh, they conducted a rapid assessment to the village, they discovered that people have a lot of issues which are pressing, which are more than tree planting. So tree planting was very, very low down the hierarchy of needs and demands of the communities. And that's why JGI decided to say, okay, we are doing conservation, but we should start with the local community, understand their concerns, try to address their concerns, then channel the agenda of conservation. As you can see here, this is Takare in action, community mapping of natural resources in their village land. This is one of the very beginning process that we do with the community when we go to talk to them and understand their concern, what their value, what are their natural resources in the village, and what is important to them, what is needs attention. So after talking to them with the aid of a high resolution satellite image printed down there, people could locate where they farm, could locate where they live. And then from there, we could start with planning now on how they need to manage their own resources. The one of the action or end product of engaging communities developing village land use plan, whereby communities develop village land use plan with, with connected village forests to protect water sources, control soil erosion, minimize siltation to rivers and lakes, chimpanzee and their habitat being protected, wildlife corridor creation through connectivity of village forest reserve and local community, of course, own conservation outcome because they participate actively in this process. As you can see this map on the right here, this is one of the output of the engagement of the communities whereby several villages in the lake zone uh, near Gombe National Park were involved in the planning of village land use plan. So every village planned their land and then allocate village forest reserve in adjacent and connected to the nearby village forest reserve so that in the end of the day, we achieved to have this connectivity of village forest reserve all the way from Burundi, going down to Gombe National Park and beyond Gombe National Park. So this is one of the great achievement of Takare approach in conservation whereby people understand the importance, understand the need to connect their own forest reserve until the achievement of this kind of output. Once the village forest reserve is set aside, then JGI with the other partners, we come in and empower and do training to local communities using ArcGIS 1123 to empower these communities to monitor their own forests. So the training is being conducted to the people that we call them village forest monitors who are community volunteers who decide and de devote some of their time to go to the village forest and do monitoring and report the incidences they find, they find to the village authorities so that village authority can take actions to minimize those threats. So using this landscape conservation uh, project, we have already trained 91 community village volunteers and forest monitors who since 2019 to date, more than 100,000 survey forms have already been submitted to ArcGIS Online platform. The information which goes to ArcGIS Online are shared with decision makers via dashboard. As you can see these photos, this is one of the FM or forest monitor who was in a training, uh, trying to understand how to use the survey one, two, three form which we'll call it in our local language, Kiswahili, is known as Uangalizi wa Misitu. As you can see here, one of the forest monitors in Kigale village at work. So he's using his uh, smartphone to go in the forest. As you can see this high resolution satellite image, in the middle here, there's a forest, there's a village area. So this is a village center known as Kigale which borders uh, nearby Lake Tanganyika on the western side. And then on the eastern side, there's mountain ranges, which are all of Miombo woodland, et cetera. 
So the yellow points you see here, these are the points that the FOM has been uh, collecting several information about observation of wildlife, threats, chimpanzee observations such, such as nests, chimp call, chimp droppings, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then he delivered this information to his village authorities, as well as uploading this information to ArcGIS online and then shared by decision makers at the district level via ArcGIS online platform. Forest monitoring points in the landscape, as you can see, the point I just showed in the previous slide is just from one village. And here we have a Burundi border. And then this forest monitor uh, across the project landscape from the Burundi border all the way south to Mpanda, more than 500 kilometers, whereby 90, 90 91 FMs have smartphone and do monitoring of the forest and then upload information to ArcGIS online. This is one of the dashboard that we use to communicate this information from forest monitors to decision makers. As you can see, it gives hints of figures of various incidences found by the FOM. As you can see, there is incidence of forest destruction, illegal housing, illegal agriculture, hunting, livestock. But also we have incidences of wildlife. This is chimpanzee sightings, and then we have wildlife, other wildlife sightings. So through this uh, dashboard, decision makers quickly understand what is going on in the landscape, then understand where there is a lot of threats so that if they plan for interventions, they know exactly what, where to go and what threat is the most pressing, which needs quite uh, immediate response. So restoration of forest buffers, around Gombe National Park, as you can say, you can see, I said we work with, with uh, a lot of villages. And now this is one of the villages known as Kigali. As you can see, in 2005, they had a lot of fields and farms being cultivated on steep slopes. So the trees were really, really uh, reduced. But after engaging them with this uh, land use plan programs and conservation programs, the Takari approach, the community understood the process and took over the management of their forest reserves and then decided to abandon the fields which were in steep slopes and then move them further to areas where, by, where, where there is no much uh, prone to erosion. And now, as you can see in the next uh, satellite image of here, the Kigali village in 2020, there's more trees coming up and the fields or the plots that you see here, which were cultivated by then, were already gone because communities decided to cultivate on other area, which are of course far away from their villages. But they say it's better we cultivate far away and walk long distances, but we know that we are protected from siltation to, river, to, to rivers and lakes, but also landslides, which could potentially impact our villages will, will be away from us. Uh, and at last, you can see now restoration of chimpanzee habitat in Gombe Burundi corridor, whereby village land use plan developed and enhanced the allocation of village forest reserve in a continuum from Gombe National Park to Burundi border. Community continue to monitor their own forests using ArcGIS Survey 123. Regular monitoring currently going on to reduce those threats and ensure continuation of restoration of Gombe Burundi community forests. Soil erosion now controlled, water sources protected, and community own the process. And therefore, chimpanzee are ensured with habitat for their survival and can move within the corridor. So this photo is one of the villages known as Kiziba, whereby the forest monitor, while doing forest monitoring, he took, he saw this is a chimpanzee nest, and he took a picture and then he uploaded on ArcGIS online. So I accessed it from ArcGIS Online, which is also accessible to the decision makers in the district who can know what to do with the intervention within the project area. So thank you so much for your attention.
I hope it was interesting and all the best. Asanteni Sana. Hi, my name is Moraine and with me is Yori and we are from African Parks. And African Parks was founded in 2000 in response to the conservation crisis. And we pioneer the public-private partnership model, which basically means we manage protected areas on behalf of governments and in partnership with local communities, funding partners and commercial investors. We currently have over 3,500 uh, staff employed and 96% of them are from local regions. Currently, we manage 19 parks over 11 countries and a total of 14.7 million hectares. And our vision is part of the world's broader conservation vision, which is that 30% of Africa's unique landscapes are and then African Parks' objective for 2030 is that, that we manage 30 protected areas in Africa. And that is quite exciting objectives, um, but in deciding on which areas to protect, there are some fundamental concepts that we need to take into consideration. So one of these is that it's more cost effective to conserve intact ecosystems than it is to restore degraded ones. Um, another one is that scale and connectivity matters to ensure resilience and to provide globally significant benefits through ecosystem services. And then the last one is that legislation is also very important. So the chances of a national park surviving in comparison to just a local forest reserve um, is a little bit better. And so what we've done, and this is where GIS comes in, is we built this tool and conducted this analysis to identify anchor protected areas, which are at scale and relatively intact. And we did this by means of a web application. and We used the Esri Leaflet um, API, and we built this application and hosted all the data layers on ArcGIS Enterprise. So these layers include UNEP's World Database of Protected Areas, um, a deforestation layer, tree cover, surface water, Facebook's higher resolution settlement layer. And on this web map, you can then play around with the different layers. You can, you can filter out protected areas based on some of these values. And the, the methodology we followed is as follows. So, Basically, we started with the World Database of Protected Areas, which are 8, 000, over 8,000 protected areas in Africa, which is 15% of the continent. But the problem here is that it gives a little bit of a skewed picture. So yes, it's 15% of Africa, but so many of these areas are very small. And also many of these areas can be seen as paper parks. So in essence, yes, it's a national park on paper, but if you actually go there, there's nothing left of the area. So we wanted to see if we can find a list of, of parks or protected areas that, that are still fairly intact and are large, so larger than um, 500 square kilometers. And um, the, the key thing here is that those anchor protected areas can then be restored and managed well, it can then be used to expand into landscape areas. And it's almost to see this as the biggest bang for your buck. So if you invest in these 161 protected areas, you will make sure that the quickest, fastest way and the most cost efficient way you will protect a big piece of Africa. And it's not to say that the smaller areas are not, not important. In fact, those are very important for specific species protection. But this is just really to sort of say, for the least amount of effort, this is what you need to protect right now. And for us to decide on which area can be seen as a core area, this is what we've done. So we here in, um, in Cote d'Ivoire and Ivory Coast, and as you can see, there are all of the protected areas on the WDPA's list. And I want to highlight Thai National Park there, and then also Marawoe National Park. And 
if this is all the information, the only information you have, you might think, yes, both of them, they're national parks, they should both be core protected areas. But in fact, if you then put a threat layer on top, so if we put um, a people layer on top, you can see that, in fact, Marawa National Park is overrun by people. So it makes you a little bit question if it's still intact. Whereas Thai National Park seems fairly free of um, people activities. And the same with deforestation. So very interestingly with the deforestation layer is that, that there's a lot of deforestation happening in the forest reserves and actually no deforestation outside um, of these reserves. And, and the reason for that is that the deforestation layer looked at 20 years of deforestation. So all the way back since 2000. So the deforestation outside of these areas basically happened before 2000 and therefore it doesn't show up on this layer because there aren't any trees left. But as you can see again, Marawa National Park, there has happened a lot of deforestation whereas Thai National Park um, has seen no deforestation. So just looking at this, you can immediately say, you know, do we take Thai or Marawe as the core area? And it's definitely, we need to take Thai National Park. And then here's also the key thing now is that you can then, once you manage Thai National Park very well and the area has recovered and is stable, then you can expand into surrounding areas to form an even bigger conservation landscape. And there's just another, image, a satellite image showing the, the difference um, between the two areas. So that, that is the, the methodology we followed to, in the end, go from that 8,000 protected areas to 161 core protected areas. And the use of the GIS tools, I mean, without that, we wouldn't have been able to do that. So now we're going to talk a little bit more about how we then use geospatial data for protected area management and um, more specifically how we integrate ArcGIS Enterprise with other tools. And Jordi will be talking more about that. Thank you, Marijn. Um, yeah, so taking you from the big picture of Africa to, to part of the, the protected area management and the way we use ASRI on a daily basis. Um, this. This picture you're seeing here is actually just all of our data in terms of, um, of points and uh, lines and polygons um, within Africa. Um, if we can go to the next slide, we can see what that results in. Um, in Argyra National Park in Rwanda. Um, uh, but I would really like to just take you through this process um, in a short video because I think it's very useful to be able to, um, to use the data this way and also to be able to have all of your data in a single, um, in a single source as an organization and then split it out afterwards. So Marijn, if you could please start that video. Now let me show you a little bit of what that looks like. Um, this is our enterprise data management map in RJS Pro. This is where um, we manage all of our points, um, line and polygon features, or at least the static ones within our organization. Um, so you'll see a lot of points here that are in or around the parks that we manage um, and that are important for park management to know as geospatial features. As you can see, we divided them up in a couple of different um, feature layers. And um, I'd like to just uh, take you through to one of our parks, which is Zakuma, um, to use as an example. So let me go there. So these are all the points that we have um, for Zakuma, all of the information that we have that is static at the moment. Um, if I pull up this little menu here, you'll see, for instance, the backbone in the park, the communication backbone towers. And I will get back to you about that. You see, these are their locations. Um, all of that data is managed through here. It's coming in here um, straight from the parks and from ourselves. Um, we manage it here and make sure all the attributes are correct. And then they go to the feature layers, um, which are the same feature layers that you saw in that um, RGS Pro map. So you've got the boundaries, the land use, the community, the operations, the tourism, and the natural. 
And what we do then is to create a view layer from these feature layers to send to the different parts. So you're looking at the Zakuma operations point layer, and this is the actual visual part of our data for this specific park, which means that uh, when they work in this area, the people that are working in these parks um, and that are working on the GIS um, solutions, they can only see this part of our data, they work in this part of our data, but it gets sent back to our main data source, so our main feature um, layers, so that um, at a head office and at an organizational level, all of these things are always synchronized. It gets sent into the content, so you see now we went from the overall layers to the Zakuma layers, that's then being pumped into a Zakuma base map so you see all of these different points again um, on the map and from there we are actually sending that to our um, situational awareness system uh, within Africa Parks we use Earth Ranger. So in Earth Ranger you see all the same points again. Um, so for instance those backbone towers that I just showed you um, are going to be in here. You see the towers are here. These are exactly the same points and as in our enterprise system. Um, we can here see um, some of Sinyaka Minia, which is a different reserve. You can see Greater Zakuma. And all of this um, information is coming straight from our enterprise system. And every night at midnight, it is being synced. So whatever changes we make is automatically also included into these maps. Um, and you can imagine that for us um, to manage um, the static features um, in a way like this is, is incredible. It's an incredible feat um, and it's really nice for us to be able to work that way because it means that we have one source of truth, which essentially is all of the data in here and to go back to Africa, all of the data coming into our organization. So it's all in a single point is being split out into the parts, um, but all of our applications and all of our situational awareness and the dashboards in the future are all linked back to these feature layers, which is incredibly useful for us. All right, thank you. Yeah, so, so this was just in short, you know, how we now are managing these kind of, of, of big data in our organization how we're splitting it out to our parks and you know how we work with that on the ground. Um, yeah, so this, this was our presentation. Thank you for watching. If you'd like to know how to do this or how to do the analysis that Marijn did or that I did, um, yeah, please just contact us. There's no problem, we can show you. And if you have any questions, please ask them during the Q&A and we'll be there to answer them. Thank you very much. So hello, uh, my name is Jake Wall. I'm Director of Research and Conservation at the Mara Elephant Project. Um, and thank you to Esri for inviting me to speak today. Um, I'll be talking about conservation technology for elephants um, and uh, the Mara ecosystem. So Mara Elephant Project um, is based in the Maasai Mara in Kenya which is a, uh, the tip of the Serengeti ecosystem in Tanzania. And uh, our project was established in 2011 to uh, address the issue of elephant poaching um, and insecurity um, around the ivory trade. Um, so we are based in the, in the conservancies in the north of the Mara Reserve. Um, and it's a spectacular landscape, um, incredible biodiversity, home to 2.2 million ungulates, that migrate uh, yearly, and that's probably what it's best known for. And it's also um, known for its population of elephants. So there's roughly 2,500 elephants that live in the Mara part of the ecosystem and a, and a greater population of seven to 8,000 that live across um, the Serengeti Mara. Um, so three areas of focus for us are on elephant, on the elephant population, on elephant movement and range, um, habitat, as well as understanding and monitoring conflict and trying to mitigate human elephant conflict. Um, we, in all of those areas of focus, we, we monitor, we do research, 
And we also have teams on the ground that are doing applied protection and, and conservation. Um, so starting with one of our big areas of focus is on tracking data. Um, so we currently use a platform called EarthRanger uh, for integrating data from ranger teams, from elephants, from vehicles, um, which all come into a centralized database. Here you can see one of our elephants uh, wearing a, a tracking collar. Basically, it consists of a GPS and a satellite modem, which so the GPS gets a, a fix and the satellite can then send or it can send via satellite every hour. Um, and so we get regular updates on the locations of elephants. We also have other tracking devices that we use for vehicles and rangers. Um, that all comes into a centralized place. The uh, interesting thing with the data, um, and this is an animation that we've created using ArcGIS Pro, um, and we can visualize then the movements of, of the elephants um, in, and see, and we come up with very interesting um, insights into what they are doing on the landscape. So um, we typically say elephants boat with their feet. And so by watching where they go and what resources they select, um, we better understand what their needs are across uh, the landscape. Here's an interesting example um, where an elephant is performing what we call a streak. So they'll sometimes move in high speed linear fashion across the landscape and move from one protected area to another. And so that um, we get a lot of these streaks and then that helps us to define connectivity in the landscape. Oh, sorry. Um, so here we, we can take all of the data from all elephants that we've tracked thus far, and we're developing up a corridor uh, model. So we're looking at the connectivity that each track of a tracked animal represents and how it relates to all of the other animals, and then looking at how the, um, the weight of the different tracks um, combined in this model. And here we can see as you get uh, yellow, uh, tracks, areas that are of high connectivity and thus of importance for uh, corridor planning. So this data we can use then for informing spatial planning uh, and helping to secure range and space for elephants in the future. And this data, um, we're doing this analysis in collaboration with Colorado State University in, in Colorado, as well as the Kenya Wildlife Service. Um, we can also use the data for real-time alerting. And so we can look at things like an elephant that has stopped moving. Uh, we can look at elephants that cross through virtual uh, barriers, so geofences. We can look at elephants that slow down statistically over the course of their movement, which might indicate injury or disease. Uh, we can look at elephants when they get close to other features in the landscape. And we can also, in real time, look at elephants as they move through the environment and their habitat and get into conditions that may be of, of concern. So areas of high human settlement, for instance. Um, we implemented this system largely in, in response to the high levels of poaching that were experienced in the Mara uh, in 2009, 10, 12, up until about 2015 or 2016 is when ivory poaching started to come down. But here's an example. Today, um the 19th of April. This is our worst day at the Mara Elephant Project. It's a day when um, an elephant is killed in the Mara. More specifically, is the elephant that's named Omondi. Uh, he has been speared twice in the kidneys. Once two. And on the other side, at the same time, this was late last night. We got an immobility alarm this morning. The rangers are currently on the tracks. The poachers who killed Amandi. This time, their tusks, his tusks were not removed, probably because they realized that he had a collar on. So unfortunately, in this case, the, the 
it was after the fact that we found the elephant, but because of the real time reporting on the immobility, the rangers were able to follow up and find those poachers. And so conservation technologies played a big role in our work in elephant monitoring and, and especially with the real time monitoring. Um, a lot of the tools that we use for the analysis of, of um, elephant movement are, are um, based on ArcGIS. And so we had developed a package called Movement Ecology Tools for ArcGIS. This was for ArcGIS Desktop. Um, this is publicly available as a tool uh, add-in for ArcMap um, and available at uh, the website movementecology.net. Um, we're currently uh, revising this tool package because of um, the need to update it to work with ArcGIS Pro. Um, and we're about to release this new tool package called Movement Ecology Tools for Python, um, which will be purely Python based and should integrate better with the newer Esri ArcGIS uh, Pro um, software. Um, so another key area of focus for us is in elephant habitat monitoring. Um, obviously ele elephants are huge. They need a lot of resource. They eat a ton of food and, and require water and, and huge areas of space. Um, and so understanding the habitat that they um, they live in is is a is of critical importance. Um, unfortunately, in our area, there's been quite a bit of habitat destruction. So one of the things that we see a lot is is deforestation. Um, and so we we're working together with Kenya Wildlife Service, Kenya Forestry Service, and trying to combat the illegal destruction of of forests. Um, and this forest in particular is is home to elephants. In, historically, um, unfortunately, it's been rapidly cut down, and we are working with other conservation partners to try and stop the, the deforestation rate. Um, we're also seeing a, a tremendous amount of agricultural expansion, and so um, around the protected areas, for instance, around the, the Mara Reserve and around the conservancies, we're getting more and more agriculture that's developing. Um, this also then leads to more and more elephant conflict as elephants are um, very keen on going crop rating. And I'll talk about that in, in a little bit. Um, but we're using tools to map the agricultural expansion and look at the trends in time and then also help us with real time management decision making. Another the key area for us is looking at um, the, the effects of livestock uh, on the ecosystem. And so here we're using satellite indices to um, map in different management sectors how the reflectance and this um, so surface reflectance has changed over time. So this is a, over the last 10 years or 11 years, how um, the surface reflectance. And so when you get overgrazing and, and you start getting more and more exposed earth, you get more reflectance. And this is showing up quite clearly from satellite based indices. Um, also, another um, characteristic of the landscape is the amount of fencing. So the more and more we're seeing more and more fences being built, um, especially in the last five to seven years. Um, and this is, of course, leading to conflict as well, as elephants tend to break fences, um, which is why we are primarily mapping them. Um, but also to understand the proliferation of fencing and what's driving that, um, as well as the effects on other species. So, you know, elephants can walk through fences if they have to, whereas species like zebra and wildebeest aren't, um, aren't as able to do that and it's having an effect on their movement patterns as well. So we're working with other conservation partners to understand that. Um, to do a lot of this mapping, we've developed our own Esri um, Android app called TerraChart. So this is available on the Google Play Store. It interfaces with a backend database called Landscape Dynamics. Um, and this is what we've used to collect a lot of the spatial layers, um, including roads, fences, waypoints um, and store them in a in a open access database. Um, so the landscape dynamics database is effectively feature services that are hosted in ArcGIS online. 
And here we're hosting um, all of the spatial layers that are relevant to conservation work. So roads, fences, um, settlements. And um, we do a monthly export of that data, both as a tiled base map, um, as well as shapefiles and geodatabases. Um, and anything that's considered public, uh, like roads, is then exported monthly. Um, and as it updates, and that, that way we're getting frequent updates. Um, we're also looking at publishing the system, um, and it's, it's in preparation right now for submission. So another area, um, so the third area of focus for us is in human elephant conflict. Um, so we're understandably elephants need lots of food and a very quick way to get that food is by raiding agriculture. Um, so here's an elephant um, called Ivy. She's one of, she's what we call a cropaholic because she's in a, a cluster of elephants that um, crop raids very, very frequently. Um, here you can see her movement patterns and what crop rating looks like. So on the right, we have a day-night track of hers over a short period of time. And you can see at nighttime, she goes across the river and into agricultural fields and then comes back during the daytime and hides out in these forest, gallery forest areas. Um, if we look at her entire track, we can see that she switches between modes of behavior. So if we look at the red, She's in a crop rating movement mode where she'll go to these staging sites, cross, raid agriculture, come back, hide, and do that repeatedly. Um, in the, the black track is in, an, in a regular non-crop rating state. And so we're using um, hidden Markov models to define these states of behavior. And this is being done by a PhD student at Colorado State University. So here we can see what crop rating looks like in real time um, or animated. So Ivy, Fred and Kegel all teamed up one year and ended up crop rating together over the course of about a week. And you can see um, how they use these staging sites of forest, uh, going to the agricultural fields at nighttime. And sometimes they're very coordinated in that they do it together. Other times they go their separate ways and do it alone. Um, and so we're getting the tracking data is giving us a lot of insight into what the, the behavioral strategies are. That animation was also done using ArcGIS Pro. Oops. Sorry. Back too far. So the outcome of um, crop rating is usually. Um, conflict and it's it's often results in the injury both of, on the human side and in terms of the loss of crops and, and the damage to infrastructure and then there's often retaliation to elephants that results in injury to elephants and so we're seeing a lot of these incidents now that that are quite um, concerning in terms of the, the health for elephants as well as the community. Um, if we look at the um, we can see here where we have we've recorded um, elephant conflict sites. So green dots represent where crops have been raided, red or where settlements have been damaged or fencing has been damaged. And you can see that a lot of that is occurring outside of the protected areas, um, especially for the crop raiding. And um, whereas the treatments of elephants are often within the protected areas. So what happens is elephants go out, crop raid, get injured, and then are often found and treated within the protected areas. So this is a, an emerging pattern we're documenting. Um, we can also look at how elephants, um, how the population um, can be represented in terms of um, rare, sporadic, seasonal, and habitual crop rating based on the amount of time that the elephants are spending within agricultural zones. And so the data is showing us that there are um, a lot of elephants that are habitual crop raiders, but the proportion of the population is quite small compared to the overall. Um, and then we can also see that male elephants are typically more um, considered habitual crop raiders than females. There are more elephants that are male habitual crop raiders. Uh, 
We can also look at trends over time, um, and we see that the um, conflict is very much linked to rainfall um, and vegetation greenness. And so here, the, the blue line is showing us the rainfall. Um, 2021 is, has been a dry year. I'm oh, sorry. Um, and we've seen less conflict um, right now, but we're not done the year yet. Um, but it, it's interesting how it, it is tracking the, the rainfall. Um, and this is also crops and settlements. So one of the, the ways we're, other than getting insight into the movement behavior, but we're also experimenting with different mitigation methods. And one of the, the key ways we can get elephants to stop crop raiding or, or temporarily at least is through um, the use of drones. And here's an example of using a thermal drone um, at night to push ivy. So this is ivy's group, um, the elephant I showed before. And elephants are quite nervous around drones because we believe because they sound like bees, uh, an angry bee swarm. And so it's quite an effective tool for pushing elephants out of areas where they shouldn't be. Um, and so this is another technology we're experimenting with um, to understand its effectiveness. In the longer term, we do need other methods and probably more passive methods of mitigation. And so things like alternative crops or passive fencing, such as beehive fencing, um, are all tools that we can, we can use. Um, so through the use of this technology and these approaches, we're, we're trying to look at reducing the harmful activities on elephants, their, their range and the habitat and other wildlife. Um, we're using applied research to inform conservation management and spatial planning is a key part of that. Um, and hopefully resulting in positive changes. And our long-term goal is really a stable, healthy elephant population that coexists with local communities across the greater Maori ecosystem. Um, so I'd like to thank all of our partners um, and especially Kenya Wildlife Service and the County Government of Narok and, uh, and also to the Esri Conservation Program who have supported us with software and um, throughout the years. And we're very grateful um, to all that have contributed to this work. So thank you very much. Thank you once again to the presenters we've had for this session. And I'd like to invite them now to um, I'd like to invite them now to turn on the webcam so that we can proceed to the Q and A uh, section for their session. So, can we request um, Paul, Maureen, and Jake to um, participate in the Q and A section? And uh, Matt will have the questions for you. Yeah, thank you, everyone. I'll just uh, give a moment while the other speakers, uh, hopefully they can hear us if they are unable to access their videos. But uh, I'll start off with a great generic question that came in um, from Susan. Um, and it's what's been the most surprising use um, uh, when using the different GIS tools. We just heard there at the end about drones helping to move elephants at night. At night. Uh, but what was the most surprising use of, of GIS tools within your work? Meryl, I guess we'll start with you. That's the only camera I can see. Marion, I'm not hearing you. Thanks, sorry, the organizer had to unmute me. Um, so for us, the most surprising use of JS tools, it's almost, almost where to begin, because for us, um, all of the data we capture often have a geospatial component to it. Um, so we've been using it from the ground up all the way to, as, as I've just presented, making more sort of strategic decisions. 
So I think that's maybe some of the more straightforward things that we are all aware of and use it um, is in the field and capturing information in the field. Um, but what we have found this year was we can also use geospatial data and GIS at a more strategic level. Um, and I think that definitely for many of my colleagues um, was a big surprise. So yeah, always advocating for, for using GIS data where we can. Thank you. Um, and Jake, Jake's with us, but without a camera, so no worries. But Jake, any comments on that question? Where has use of GIS been most surprising? It's in a lot of it has to do with the power of visualization of data. Um, and I think one of the things that's impressed me a lot about what the, we've seen in the presentations this afternoon is the, the level and quality of the visualization of, of different geographic data sets. Um, and I think you know, most people can understand a map when they see one. And I think that's a very powerful approach um, to addressing conservation issues is in the cartographic outputs. Um, and that's that's something that that Esri particularly excels at, um, and things like Esri story maps and and different products um, make that communication of visualization of data very easy. Thanks very much, Paul. If you can hear us, any comment from you on that question? Surprising uses of JS. <laughs> Hello, can you hear me? We can, Paul, yes. Ah, yes. So uh, on our side, in our organization, what was surprising, uh, well, we have been using GIS for many years, but uh, of course, the coming of ArcGIS online and the way we could share almost real-time data, that was surprising. And I think uh, most of our partners that we were working with they were very surprised that the forest monitor could uh, collect information in the forest and then upload it. And at the same time, the people who have access to the dashboard, they could see that information and they could track back what is happening in the forest. So I think this interoperability or the interconnection between the data collector and the platform and the dashboard uh, to decision makers was was a very surprising news and it was very interesting i think right thank you all for your thoughts on that question um so a question here again uh, i think you've all mentioned this in your various presentations but a question from power um and i'm just going to adapt it to make it more general it's about the importance of multi-stakeholder analysis so I think, um, Paul, you mentioned around the community-centered conservation, um, but generally to you, how important is it to have that multi-stakeholder analysis within your uh, work, and especially in the park management maps is what Powell was referring to. So how, how important is that multi-stakeholder analysis and is it included um, in the park management maps? Uh, Marin, over to you first, if that's okay. Thanks. Um, yes, thanks, Matthew. So I think it is extremely important to involve all stakeholders. And I think we, I think everyone who's on, on this um, webinar, we all understand the value of um, GIS data, um, but, but not all people understand it. So if we can package that information into a, con a consumable format for the different stakeholders that is so powerful so it's from on the ground interacting with community members capturing the information there but then giving them the feedback and showing them dashboard all the way to looking to so looking at real-time information but then also extracting it to to the park manager who maybe wants to see information on a weekly basis or a monthly basis all the way out to maybe a more director level who wants to see information to make strategic decisions. So I think there are all these different users and stakeholders that for us um, operating in, in a number of different parks, it's very important to cater for all of those um, users. Thank you, Marin. Um, Jake, any comments on that? Yeah, I fully agree. I mean, I think it's, um, it, it's really 
you need to package the information in different ways. Um, and you know, if it's a scientific audience versus a public audience or um, or a community that um, you're sharing information with, um, it, it does take a lot of skill. And how do you present that information? Um, and and there are a number of wonderful tools to do it. But getting the information out um, on data that's been collected and the analysis that's been done, I think, is such a key area that's probably under underdeveloped still. Um, certainly for our organization, I think we we need that's an area where we could improve. Um, and how do we engage with a larger group of stakeholders based on the data that we've been collecting? Um, and so that's that's something we'll be exploring further. Thank you, Jake. And Paul, any comments? Yeah. So on our side, as you you see the you saw the presentation, is that we have multi uh, stakeholders like the community, the government, the other conservation partners. So we believe that uh, this tool for multi sector analysis would be very useful because the landscape that we are working with has multiple stakeholders of which we cannot rely only on one stakeholder to achieve our conservation goal because we have the coaching habitat which is under the government, the central government, and the, then we have the buffer zones so or the outside uh, areas which are owned by the communities. So, and these communities have different knowledge levels and have different perspectives and when you come to the district government, they have also other perspectives. And when you come also to conservation partners, they also have different uh, perspectives and objectives. So we think that is very uh, interesting when we have ability to bring all these interests together and uh, address our challenges. That's what I can say for now. Thanks very much, Paul. I'm just going to squeeze in one more, one or two more questions and then a final comment. I'll just direct these to individual people in the interest of time. Um, so quite a, a general question, Marin, for you um, around uh, one well, audience member mentioned the display or uh, spread of conservation work across the continent. And they noted you know, there was a gap uh, just around DRC. Um, are we seeing any areas that this work cannot reach due to things like connectivity issues? Um, and is it the case there's so much to do, it's just a case of time, or are there barriers to some of this work being used across the whole continent? Uh, Matthew, just to clarify, so are you referring to the work, um, the last part of our presentation, which was talking more about the actual data or the selecting those core areas? I guess more higher level, like your, your, your work in conservation, do, do you see barriers where that couldn't stretch or areas you may have selected but unable to work there because of technology issues or connectivity issues? So I guess any larger barriers to the spread of your work? Okay, no, that's, that's a good question. Um, so African Parks, the, the, the project we take on, um, we we will take on projects that are in very difficult environments. So um, if there are challenges, yes, we, we need to be aware of it, um, but we are very pragmatic in that we still, we, we go for those challenges. So an example is Chinko, which is a reserve in Central African Republic, um, which is far from everything it takes months to get a truck up there on the road to get some um, resources to that area. Um, but it was recognized that that is a very, uh, very important area to protect. Um, there are some communities around there that also need help. Um, so irrespective of the limitations, um, we still see it as a very important area. And together with that, what is so important is that the government is actually um, excited about it and, and you have the buy-in from the government. Um, so that's, that's really, I think, I think probably that is a more, is, is the biggest barrier. If, if you don't have that support from government, um, then it will be very difficult to, to operate in that area. So it always, it comes back to the stakeholders. If the area is important and, and it's there and it needs to be protected, um, then we'll do what, what we can to, to get in there. 
Thanks very much, Marin. Um, and Jake, one uh, question for you, um, and you, I think you began to touch on this topic, but with all the data layers you're collecting, are you looking forward uh, into the future in using any other sort of more advanced technologies around predictive uh, technologies and obviously things like AI and machine learning to enrich your collected data with um, derived data or predicted data? Thank you. Yeah, um, so we are experimenting with um, machine learning techniques more to do with the recognition of individual elephants right now, and we've developed um, a system called Elephant Book that we are um, we're publishing um, that can ID elephants based off their features. In terms of landscape um, and predicting changes in landscape, that is an area that, yes, we're keenly interested in, but we haven't made much progress yet. So we're building a, uh, currently building a collector app that will help us with digitizing key features in the landscape that we hope then can feed into machine learning approaches to predict um, and, and map those features more easily. Because the area over which elephants range is, is quite substantial and it's difficult to do it um, manually. So yeah, we're very interested in machine learning approaches and also, you know, multispectral, hyperspectral imagery, um, and combining those into what we already um, have collected with elephant tracking data and so on. Thank you very much, Jake. Um, so that's all the questions we have time for now. I just wanted to share one uh, question that we'll answer offline, but just to show uh, the reach of this audience. We had a fantastic question from uh, Rabia in Pakistan who's very eager to learn around the um, animal movement models that have been used. So we'll follow up with that one offline, but just to show you the questions are coming from right across the region uh, more broadly as well. So on that, uh, Pauline, back to you. Thanks, Mike. And thanks to the presenters for the wonderful presentations, as well as um, for responding to the questions that came in. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have for the user presentations and the Q&A section. We want to again extend our thanks to all the presenters today. And uh, in case we were not able to respond to the questions you had, uh, we will get back to you via email. So we'll go to the next poll question. And again, Raquel will pull the next poll question. And just based on the presentations we've seen, we've seen that um, a number of our presenters have been using different aspects of our technology to support the conservation efforts across ecosystems and protected areas. So with that, we'd just like to know from your end, what have you been using or what are you primarily leveraging from ArcGIS today? Great responses all around. I can see that mostly we have users on the desktop component of our system. Also, a number of users have been using all the different components that have been listed. The next one being on ActuS Online and something on mobile apps. And this is really good to see how our users are taking advantage of our system or the different components of our system. And um, we'll see moving forward how, again, you can further leverage this using the conservation tools we have. Thanks for participating in that poll.